I think it's Rishi's. Yes, yes, yes. We are live now, sir. You're live now? Yes, sir. We are live now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just mute your this thing. Yeah, sir. So, uh, thank you for uh, being part of this thing. So, we have here at the master course of uh, organized by us and projected by Author TV. We, uh, I wish it's the program that we are doing almost every two months once. And uh, today uh, we have none other than the master himself, JD. <laughs> we, everyone likes to call him JD, but it's 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 a short name, but it has a huge meaning behind it. I think starting from his research work and starting from his mesmerizing talks and. Uh, uh, he's on fire. Whenever we go onto the global platform on the shoulder, all I see is he sets the stage on fire and uh, we enjoy him watching his live surgeries and especially, uh, I think not me and Dr. Sendilven and everyone across the globe loves his talks on biomechanics because I think that's a very important thing and, and it's also a talk that is always commonly missed out and I don't think anything in shoulder works better if not understanding the biomechanics itself. A short intro about um, him. I, I, I don't think I have to give a intro because everyone in the shoulder community is crazy knows him and he works with uh, the global team of Philip Valenti, Bassam and uh, they have been the global path runners for shoulder but of course he's one of the elite shoulder surgeons from uh, Paris has completed his entire training there and he's also his has his PhD and multiple research works going on in uh, especially with the computerized and also the biomechanical studies and putting uh, the uh, shoulder surgery with navigation and multiple processes here yeah. and again we have an interesting topic today it's going to be on uh, again scapular dyskinesia should we call it that way or stam or i think i, I I'll, 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 I'll give the argument to jd and before this i would also like to uh, thank him for in his busy schedule accepting us and thank you for being part of this and second we also have our uh, senior faculty and uh, my uh, very close friend and senior colleague, uh, Dr. Sendil Velen here, who heads the department in uh, one of the top hospitals in the southern part of India. It is Miot. Uh, again, uh, thanks for accepting in his busy schedule to be part of this course. And just a few words by Dr. Sendil, and we'll go to the talk by JD. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. JD, for uh, accepting. Uh, yeah, it's been it's it's always an uh, enigma when we actually talk about uh, the scapula, scapular dynamics, you know, the biomechanics. Uh, you know, how much ever we actually read about it, uh, still it always is an enigma. So I am um, without much, um, you know, wasting much time. I'll uh, let you get on with your talk, and we'll have a discussion at the end, and we'll uh, fire you with your questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Yeah. Jerry. I think we give on the uh, mic to without wasting any time to JD, please. Yeah. Thanks a lot for all these uh, kind words. And uh, let me share my screen. Those are not kind words. Those are true words. <laughs> Thank you for your kind, true words. My screen? Raj, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Is we can, we can yes. hear okay. you well. We can see you well. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so it's good that you mentioned Bassem El Hassan because he has been really my uh, my teacher uh, on this topic, and we are uh, still, uh, uh, I think, learning uh, lots uh, about about this. And um, and so I'm I'm very pleased to present uh, what we believe is is true today, but will probably not be true tomorrow, uh, because this is uh, quickly. Uh, evolving. So you all know, you mentioned these biomechanical talks, uh, you all know that we have 14 muscles that both move but also stabilize the shoulder and I think it's very important to understand that the shoulder needs to be stabilized dynamically uh, by muscles to work properly and among these 14 muscles, six are uh, specifically important to the uh, scapulothoracic articulation. So here you can see the six muscles and among these six muscles, uh, you have two uh, that are really essential uh, to have a proper function. One is the trapezius that you can see on the left. You can see what it does. It's simulated here uh, by uh, cords. And you can see that when all the four 
heads of the trapezius, so uh, anterior, upper, middle, and lower trap, uh, all contract. You can see that the uh, shoulder blade, the scapula, goes into upwards rotation, which is essential if you want to have uh, a complete movement of abduction because you need to clear the space uh, between the acromion and the greater tuberosity. And so if you don't have the fu well-functioning trapezius, this is not going to work properly. And then the other great big muscle of uh, the scapula thoracic joint is the serratus anterior, uh, which you can see in action here. You see how it plicates, uh, um, how it, uh, oh, sorry, not plicates, how it fixes uh, properly the, the scapula against the, the chest wall. So as Raj uh, mentioned very um, uh, clearly before, uh, there is uh, some discussion regarding the terminology. Uh, it has been called scapulothoracic dysfunction. It has been called scapular winging, dyskinesis, dyskinesia, scapula alata, or snapping scapula. And all these are uh, different words that uh, all mean basically the same thing and that are unclear. And so Bastian decided to simplify this and to make this more clear. And I think he's completely right. Uh, all these are abnormal motion of the scapulothoracic joint. So let's call that STAM, scapulothoracic abnormal motion. And so what is STAM? It's a dysfunction of uh, the uh, normal uh, coordinated uh, scapular movement, which leads to chronic pain, limited range of motion, deformity, and uh, uh, the prevalence is probably much higher than what we previously uh, thought it was. And so what is very, very important, and I think this is one of the big messages of this talk, is that you need to distinguish what we call functional STEM and what we call structural STEM. So functional STEM, there is no structural lesion. Everything works perfectly well. It's just a problem of, of coordination. The muscles do not contract. Uh, in a coordinated, uh, proper way. But so if the clinical examination is normal, if the imaging is normal, if the EMG is normal, then you can think you have a functional stamp. But most of the time, everything is not normal. And uh, uh, so this is not a functional stamp. This is a structural stamp. If it's not normal, it is a structural stamp. If everything is normal, it is a functional stamp. So let's start with what is easy. When things are not normal, it is a structural stem. You need to understand what is not normal. And when you understand what is not normal, you understand the way the scapula moves and you understand how you're going to treat it. And it's quite easy. It's much easier, I think, than uh, what people think because uh, once you understand what goes wrong, then it's very easy to treat it. So the serratus anterior, we've seen what it does. It stabilizes the scapula when the head is going to push to do a movement of abduction or forward elevation, the head is going to push against the glenoid, but if nothing holds the scapula firmly to the rib cage, the scapula is going to lift, and this is what happens. So you can see uh, on the left side, everything is normal, and when we test uh, elevation against resistance, you can see that there is no serratus anterior, the, the, the scapula goes up because nothing holds and prevents the scapula from from being um, uh, from going up and nothing helps the scapula to stay uh, against the rib cage. Then we have the trapezius. So we've seen previously what the trapezius does. So let's see what happens when the trapezius is not here. You can see already in the resting position how the scapula looks. The scapula is tilted downwards because you don't have the trapezius that is pulling it upwards. Uh, in a proper uh, uh, resting position. And when this lady tries to do some abduction, what happens? Well, she cannot do abduction because very early, sorry, I go uh, again to this video, very early, the humeral head, the humerus, is going to impinge uh, with the uh, acromion because very early, uh, uh, the, the scapula will not lift properly and... and and go uh, with the abduction movement. And so uh, there will be no uh, possible abduction. So you see, there's no real point in, in describing precisely uh, how uh, these two stands are, because once you understand uh, what muscle does what, well, you understand very clearly why this lady has the scapula in this position and why the man uh, before had the scapula in, in another position. And then you have 
more uh, uh, hidden causes that uh, can also be seen in chronic AC dislocation because the uh, AC is also part of the uh, 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 scapulothoracic uh, complex. Uh, it can also affect the scapulothoracic uh, movement. Of course, if you have chronic glenohumeral dysfunction, stiffness, pain, uh, well, uh, you're not going to move as much in uh, the glenohumeral uh, joint as you should. And so to compensate, you're going to move more in the scapulothoracic joint. And so from the back, when you look at your patient, it can look like his uh, scapula is moving abnormally. Then you have, of course, uh, the parsonage turner, which is uh, a neuritis, uh, so a nerve problem. So here it, it is, of course, a, a serratus problem. You can see that the scapula is lifting. There is no active serratus, but it is not an isolated paralysis of the long thoracic nerve as we've seen before. It's a parsonage turner in this case. And you can have mechanical impingement, as you can see here, a big osteochondroma that is going to impinge between the scapular body and the ribs. And of course, we can understand very easily that the movement of the uh, scapula against the rib cage might be affected uh, by such uh, lesions. And then finally, uh, a, a rare case, but uh, it's something that uh, uh, we can see in our practice is uh, FSHD, so fasciosscapulohumeral dystrophy, uh, which is a, a, a cause also of winging. And you can see that it affects both the trapezius here and uh, the serratus anterior. And so this aspect, it's important to see it once or twice in videos because when you see them, uh, these patients in your clinic, you will immediately uh, recognize them if you've seen it uh, uh, on a video before. So when you suspect a, a structural stamp, so you have your patient, he has a stamp, uh, you are going to ask him his medical history. And uh, of course, if uh, he tells you about a trauma with stretching, you can think about a stretching of the long thoracic nerve. If he tells you about ENT surgery, then of course you're going to think about the spinal accessory nerve. If he tells you about familial history of STAM, you might think of a dystrophy. And if he tells you about a very intense pain at the onset of the symptoms, then of course you're going to think of a parsonage turner. So this helps you a lot. And then you're going to have a complete clinical examination where you're going to test every muscle one by one, and we'll see that later on. Sometimes the EMG is very difficult to interpret because uh, these muscles are, are all in layers. And so it's very easy with the needle to go through one or to go through two, and you don't really know where you are. So it requires a lot of experience. And sometimes when, uh, 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 let's say, a, a, a trapezius is very atrophied, it's very easy for the uh, neurologist to go through the trapezius and to stimulate and to think that the trapezius is working, but it's actually the levator scapula that is behind that is going to uh, be functioning. So beware of the EMG, the clinical examination is much, uh, much uh, better to understand what is going on. The MRI can help. Uh, of course, you can see if the muscle is gone, if the muscle is, uh, is uh, has atrophy, and if the muscle has fatty infiltration. And of course, if you suspect dystrophy, genetic testing is important. So here, you see how we examine a uh, patient with a STAM. So first, you assess the range of motion, of course. So you can see here, there's a limitation. You can see the scapula is moving. What is red here is what I, I rubbed my finger on her skin. So this is... Uh, there's no incision, no nothing in this patient. She has never been operated. We test the range of motion and then we test the trapezius. And you can see her trapezius here contracts very well. So you ask her to raise her shoulders and you do that against resistance. And you can see the contraction of the trapezius and you can feel the trapezius and you do scapular retraction. And again, you can feel uh, the uh, middle trapezius. So if they raise the shoulders, it's, it's, it's more the upper trapezius and then it's the uh, middle and lower trapezius here with the, uh, the same movement of scapular retraction with the hands on the hips. You test the rhomboids and here the rhomboids are perfectly functioning. And then you test the serratus with the flexion resistance test. So I ask her to elevate the arm and I do resistance as we've seen in the man before. And you look uh, if the serratus is, is contracting and here I feel the serratus contracting and protraction against resistance also uh, helps you uh, to uh, test the serratus anterior. And then finally, there are two tests that uh, we call the compression tests that are necessary. And here you see, you try to replace the action of the uh, muscle that you are testing. So if you want to test the trapezius, well, you place the scapula in the position that the trapezius would uh, uh, put the scapula in. 
And so you help, you see with my thumb, I help the scapula do upward rotation and you ask to the patient if she feels better. You ask to the patient if she can move better. You can also look for a tinnel sign that is uh, going to guide you towards uh, paralysis of the long thoracic nerve. And this is the second uh, compression test, uh, is the compression test for the serratus. And here I stabilize with my hands uh, the, the scapula against the rib cage to replace the uh, serratus. And in patients who have uh, a non-functioning serratus, uh, this is magic because they cannot raise their arm and then you stabilize the scapula and their arm uh, goes up again. What is very important is to understand that this flexion resistance test for paralysis of the serratus, it is important to do it at different degrees of elevation because here you see at 30 degrees of elevation, uh, it will very often be positive even if you have a very well-functioning serratus because uh, what can happen is that you can have a hyperactivation of the pectoralis minor and a hypoactivation of the serratus although the serratus is well-functioning and if you only test it at 30 degrees of elevation, you will not be able to see that. You need to see what's going on when you go higher, higher than 90 degrees of elevation because if the uh, stem, if the uh, lifting of the scapula persists after 90 degrees of elevation, well, it means that even though you neutralize the contraction of the pectoralis minor, because this is what happens when you go higher, well, even though you do that, the serratus is still not working. So you can see here this patient, you go under 90 degrees, you can see the scapula, and you go above 90 degrees and it doesn't change anything, the scapula is still going up. Whereas if you look at this lady, you can see here the scapula is going up and you do that at 30 degrees, it is up. You cannot feel really the serratus. Then you go a little bit higher, you cannot feel the serratus. And the once you pass 90 degrees, pay attention, you're going to look at her scapula and you're going to see it goes back to a normal position. And you can really see the difference between the patient on the left, the bassem is touching right now, and my patient to the right, uh, where above 90 degrees, the serratus becomes very well functioning. Okay, so to the right, it looks very much like a functional stem because the serratus is perfectly working, but it's not coordinated. It does not contract normally, whereas on the left, it is a true paralysis. So it is a structural stem. So let's look at paralysis of the serratus anterior. It's the first cause. So it can be either stretching or compression of the long thoracic nerve. Most of the times you have a spontaneous recovery in four to six months. If you do not have a recovery after six months, then what we do is a surgical open release. This has been very well described by the team from Tours in France, uh, 73 cases in this publication from JFCS. You can see where the incision is from the paper. It's very clearly described and you can see often you find a small vascular branch that is crossing over the nerve. You don't really know how this uh, can really affect uh, uh, that nerve, but it is uh, true that when you do a, a release of that branch, a release of the nerve, uh, well, it, it, it has a very quickly, uh, a very satisfactory uh, functional results. This is a patient just one month after the surgery, uh, the patient we've seen just before, after a surgical open release. Well, sometimes the problem, uh, this nerve surgery does not work. And sometimes you see the patients too late for nerve surgery. After 12 months, uh, you, we know that the nerve surgery does not work as well. And for this, uh, I think the best technique is uh, to detach the sternal head of the uh, pectoralis major and to fix it uh, to the scapula. You can see very well on this uh, artist view uh, how the uh, sternal head of the pectoralis major is going to replace uh, the uh, excursion, the, tra the, 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 the trajectory of uh, the uh, serratus anterior. And so you see, this is the patient we've seen before. Uh, so the surgery, I will not go through all the steps. You can read the paper. Uh, this is a video from Bassem that we see uh, that is very clear. But uh, basically, I can tell you about the steps. You have to open the deltopectoral uh, interval. You identify the sternal head and the clavicular head. You separate the clavicular head from the sternal head, which is sometimes uh, very difficult because it can have uh, multiple adhesions. 
and you preserve the uh, clavicular head of the pectoralis major. Then you detach with a bone chip the tendon of the pectoralis major from the humerus, and uh, then uh, you put this on sutures. You go afterwards to the scapula, you identify the medial border of the scapula, and under the skin, subcutaneously, you go uh, with uh, large forceps to retrieve uh, the uh, pectoralis major from the anterior uh, deltopectoral approach, and uh, you fix it uh, bone to bone uh, on the medial part, on the medial uh, distal medial uh, end of the scapula to uh, uh, attach the pectoralis major, the sternal head of the pectoralis major, to uh, the uh, scapula. Again, in this paper, everything is very well uh, described. It's very important to take the bony insertion of the pectoralis major because this is the only way uh, you can reach without uh, allograft or autograft directly the scapula with the pectoralis major. And this surgery works very well. You can see this patient uh, uh, with uh, probably uh, there is also so a part of tenodesis effect from the pectoralis major, but there is also probably some uh, active contraction of the pec. You can see here uh, something is happening uh, at this part of the scapula. So that was for structural stam paralysis of the serratus anterior. Now for structural stam uh, paralysis of the trapezius, well, uh, this can happen after stretching, after an injury to the neck, after ENT surgery, or sometimes in rare cases of AC joint uh, dislocation. It's very important to evaluate the functional impairment of the patient because sometimes you can see this patient, he has some abduction because, uh, uh, sorry for the sound, but you can see here his levator scapula is, con is, is uh, contracting very strongly and it is able to compensate for uh, the uh, absent trapezius. Again, in most cases, when you have a nerve injury, there is spontaneous recovery in four to six months, except if it was a clean cut of the nerve. Uh, if you do not have recovery after six months, the nerve surgery is warranted. Often it is a iatrogenic injury, and so you have to go and find the nerve, find the two stumps of the nerve. Uh, there is sometimes a neuroma that you need to remove, and uh, you can either directly suture the two uh, ends of the nerve or uh, use graft. Sometimes it is very difficult to find a stump, a proximal stump, because it is a thin nerve and it is in a lot of scar tissue and fibrosis. And so you can take a branch from C7 to uh, put it directly to the uh, distal end of the spinal accessory nerve. If uh, nerve surgery has failed or if you come too late, so after 12 months, uh, well, uh, palliative surgery, muscle transfers is probably best. The traditional transfer that has been described is the Eden Lang transfer, where you transfer the both rhomboids in the infraspinatus fossa and the levator scapula to the spine of the scapula. That we did a biomechanical study, and this does not mimic uh, the uh, movement of the trapezius as well. And so Bassem again. Uh, proposed to modify that transfer and uh, instead of transferring the rhomboids to the infraspinatus fossa, uh, you transfer the rhomboids to the spine of the scapula and the levator scapula as laterally as possible. And you can see how this mimics uh, more uh, adequately the shape of the trapezius. And so this is a patient uh, at seven months and so you can see, so in elevation, it's not very uh, interesting because uh, elevation is often possible in this patient, but it's an abduction that it is more interesting. And you can see how uh, the levator scapula is, is very lateral compared to the uh, right side and how her shoulder has recovered some uh, function thanks to this transfer. Then you have FSHG, so the dystrophy we mentioned. And so it's important to know this uh, pathology because it's the third most frequent dystrophy in the world. And it affects the periscapular muscles, especially the serratus anterior, the trapezius, but also the pectoralis major. So you cannot use it for a tendon transfer. It also affects the biceps and the triceps. Luckily, uh, the deltoid and the rotator cuff is completely preserved and the forearm also. And so, it is very important in these patients to assess the functional impairment, to assess the quality of the deltoid and the cuff, because the treatment 
will uh, rely on stabilizing definitively the scapula uh, with a scapulothoracic fusion. So the only joint that is going to be able to work is the glenohumeral joint. But if the deltoid or the cuff does not work properly, this joint is not going to move properly. So it's very important preoperatively to uh, understand how uh, things work. The compression test in these patients is almost magical because you stabilize their scapula. And because they have a well-functioning uh, glenohumeral joint, their arm works very well again. This is a classification that has been uh, done by our colleagues from Turkey. It is a great classification. Uh, uh, and I think it's very useful in clinical uh, practice. And so the patients you should not operate on are stage zero because they do perfectly well. On stage five, uh, the compression test will not work because they have a deltoid that is not working, which is very rare. But when that happens, you should not uh, perform surgery on these patients. On stage one and uh, stage four, stage one patients have very minor winging and their function is preserved. So it's probably not a great indication. And stage four, the deltoid is affected and uh, they are too severely affected for surgery to give very satisfactory results. And so that leaves us with the stage two and stage three uh, where uh, uh, the patients will most benefit of uh, the surgery. So the surgery is a scapulothoracic fusion. We cannot use the muscles of these patients because they uh, will deteriorate over time. And they have uh, been, there has been multiple uh, reports of the surgery with uh, excellent functional results. But it is important to know that uh, you can have a high rate of complications with complications that are sometimes uh, a little bit severe, uh, whether on the, on the lungs or on the ribs. So here is an example. Uh, I will not go into detail in the video. You can find that because we have published the technique. Uh, we use uh, uh, cerclage. Uh, I'm sorry about the sound again here. So you see, this is a patient at one month post-op. Uh, he was like that on the right side. You can see here the scar of the graft, the iliac crest that we take. And you can see that the rotations are preserved. And this is the patient coming for the second side at one year after surgery. So you can see how they recover these patients in the glenohumeral joint. Uh, and they have a very uh, well-functioning shoulder. They sometimes lose a little bit of internal rotation, as you can see with this guy. And so you can see what we do. We put a plate in the uh, supraspinatus fossa, a plate in the infraspinatus fossa on the scapula. Uh, and uh, we pass some uh, flexible suture cerclage around each rib, uh, and with a tension band technique, uh, we can uh, uh, really put strength between the uh, scapula and the ribs. You have here uh, multiple examples of the surgery that is, uh, again, a great, great surgery. This patient went back to surfing, uh, even though he has a, a fusion of the uh, scapulothoracic joint. So a very satisfactory uh, surgery. What is interesting to see is that uh, sometimes the results are a little bit disappointing. Initially, we had operated on her right side, but the patients, they can really expect some improvement uh, over time. This is her at three years post-op. And so you can see uh, on the right side how she improved. And what is interesting is to see how she uh, deteriorates uh, uh, on the left side because uh, of the dystrophy that is uh, progressing uh, slowly and affecting her, her muscles, her periscapular muscles. So these are the structural stamps. So you see, once you understand what's wrong, you can understand quite easily how to treat uh, these patients. The problem is functional stam. These patients... Uh, they have all the uh, characteristics of a stem that we mentioned previously. But when you examine them, you see that the nerves are okay, the muscles are okay. It's just that uh, the contraction of these muscles is not coordinated. And sometimes, often, and this has been the hypothesis from uh, Bassem, it's because of a hyperactivation of the pectoralis minor and a hypoactivation of the serratus. The problem is that we don't really know why this happened. So maybe it is indeed a hyperactivation of the pec minor and a hyperactivation of the serratus, but we don't know the etiology. We don't know why in some patients, the pec minor starts being more active and the uh, serratus starts being lazy. And you see again,
again, this patient uh, with a clear uh, functional stem. We've seen her before. Uh, uh, and uh, what is interesting is when you look at her CT scan, the CT scan, the axial view uh, has not been reformatted in planes. And when you see uh, the scapula starting with the body of the scapula and you almost see a wide view of the scapula very high before seeing the AC joint, well, you know that something is wrong in the static resting position of the, of the scapula. In these patients, the uh, emergency is not to rush because if you go straight away with surgery uh, because you think it's a posterior instability and you posterior bank card or posterior bone block or you try to do something to stabilize the, the scapula, often it will fail. These patients, they have well-functioning muscles and it's a more complex problem than just a very specific thing that you can correct uh, surgically. So first of all, you should try non-operative treatment as much as you can. Here it's in French, so unfortunately uh, you cannot understand what's going on, but it's the patient we've seen before. And this is a letter from her psychiatrist saying that she tried to strangle herself with her sling and that she uh, needed a CT scan uh, of her head because she banged her head so hard on the wall that she uh, uh, passed away and uh, they had to look for a hematoma uh, around her brain. And so it's very important. I put this slide here because uh, I think there is a, a very large amount in these patients of uh, a global problem that uh, also encompasses as a psychiatric problem and that needs to be addressed and it's very difficult for us as orthopedic surgeons to address these problems because we don't know how to address this and often the discussion with the psychiatrist is very complicated because they tell you that the patient is crazy because they cannot use uh, their arm but we think that they cannot use their arm because they are crazy so it is difficult and uh, uh, it's something that you need to discuss with the psychiatrist and when I say crazy of course you understand what i mean it's because there's a problem and i don't think there are really crazy people but it's something that they cannot control um the uh, uh main thing that you should try to do uh, non-operatively is to uh, rehabilitate them to have a physiotherapist take care of these patients the problem is that often physios do not really go understand what's going on because it is very difficult to understand what is going on. We don't understand what is going on either. And the goal, I think, is to try to strengthen the periscapular muscles and to have uh, the patient try and have a coordinated movement uh, involving the scapulothoracic muscles and the glenohumeral muscles to have a coordinated uh, movement of the ST and GH joints. Uh, there has been some... Uh, uh, trials, some neuromotor programming. This is a patient you see, you try to touch him. His, his movements are, are very complicated to understand. Everything is well functioning, but uh, clearly there is a problem that we do not really understand here. And after several months of uh, neuromotor reprogramming, which I don't really know what goes on when you send these patients to, 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 to these doctors, but it seems that this patient has improved. He has used some virtual reality glasses trying to have him move in a virtual space, and uh, he has improved this way. Philippe Moroder also described the shoulder pacemaker, which I have tried and, and can sometimes uh, provide a, a success and a solution in these patients. You can see how this patient does not control properly uh, his scapulothoracic joint. And uh, once he moves uh, with the shoulder pacemaker, it, it stimulates the muscle while uh, he uh, uh, goes on with uh, uh, abduction or elevation. And his brain starts to understand how to control his scapulothoracic uh, muscles, his uh, periscapular muscles. When nothing else works, uh, Bassem proposed a surgery, which uh, we sometimes do. Um, and I think it should be really a last resort, but uh, sometimes it, it does work uh, for these patients when no other solution can be found. And it's a combination of an orthoscopic tenotomy of the pectoralis minor that we've just seen here and a scapulopexy. That means drilling a hole through the scapula passing some graft inside that hole and going around a rib, which uh, helps you. You can see here we're stimulating, it's Bassem operating here. He's stimulating the, the serratus anterior and you see how uh, everything is working. So the muscle is well working, it's purely functional. And so you identify the rib that is just under 
uh, the, the scapula. Here we go under the scapula. And you pass a graft around the rib. And so you tie the scapula to a rib very firmly in order to have a transient uh, fixation, temporary fixation of the scapula to a rib. And hopefully with the pectoralis minor cut and the uh, scapula firmly attached to the rib, uh, the patient will start moving correctly again. And uh, in the brain, things will happen uh, that we don't understand clearly, but uh, coordination uh, will uh, uh, start again and the movement will slowly uh, uh, be restored to normal and eventually this allograft will fail but in the meantime uh, the patient will have understood again how to uh, use the periscapular muscles pro properly and so you can see this is the patient we've, we've seen initially with the clinical exam I'm sorry again for the sound but you see here is my fingers it's not the incision and this is her uh, at six months post-op and you can see how uh, after the scapulopexy, she can uh, move slightly better. It's not perfect, of course, but she is very, very much improved and she can uh, live uh, normally. What is important, and again, this I insist on this, it is not an etiological treatment. We don't understand why these patients start uh, uh, moving abnormally uh, their scapula, their scapulothoracic joint. And sometimes you do pec minor tenotomy, scapulopexy, and you can see you did not treat the etiology. So despite what you did, the patient is going to contract firmly her uh, periscapular muscles. And uh, here the patient uh, had a rib fracture uh, at the level of where the allograft was passed. Uh, you can see just uh, in regards to my scapulopexy. And so this is immediately the hematoma after the fracture that happened without a trauma. And then uh, the winging uh, started again. And uh, this is probably because this is not an etiologic treatment. We're just treating the symptoms and we don't yet really understand what is going on. So in conclusion, this is a very complex problem as you've seen, but it is important to simplify this problem uh, by uh, distinguishing functional and structural causes. It's important to eliminate straight away causes that are not uh, related to the scapulothoracic joint. If you have a very systematic clinical exam by testing every single muscle around the scapula, you will uh, especially test the trapezius and the serratus anterior and see whether they function well or not. Frequently, if you have an injury of the nerves that uh, innervate these muscles, well, you will have a spontaneous recovery uh, between three to six months after the injury. If this does not happen, then the, the first thing to do is nerve surgery after six months, between six months and 12 months. If this does not work, then tendon transfers work very well uh, in this indication. If uh, uh, you face an FSAG, you cannot use the muscles for tendon transfer anymore. And so the only solution is scapulothoracic fusion. And then we have this uh, uh, puzzling entity that is the functional stem. And for these patients, you should try to avoid surgery as much as you can. If you cannot, then pec minor tenotomy and scapulopexy can be an option, but only in last resort because it is a symptomatic treatment and not an etiological treatment. We don't really know what uh, we are treating here. Thanks a lot for your attention. And you're, of course, welcome in Paris in a few weeks now uh, for the Paris Shoulder course. Thank you for the mesmerizing talk. It was really mesmerizing. <laughs> we couldn't, uh, I think, 30, 35 minutes went like 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> as as uh, JD always said, you made the slides and you made your talk very simple. But I always feel scapulothoracic, even for shoulder surgeons, is one of the hardest uh, or uh, the uh, practical point that we need to look at. Uh, quickly going on to some question sessions, if you don't mind. So... <clears throat> First, I, I think I have a question from my side and the audience side, and then we'll go for Dr. Sendel's question. Uh, one, we we all started with the concept of scapular dyskinesia by Ben Kibler. We have read his papers and this thing, and we are enlightened by the term STAM by uh, Sam. Do you still look at it as uh, um, this alternative nomenclature or you still feel this difference is something that everyone needs to know? This is part of my first question. Uh, part B to the same question 
what do you do when there is a structural stam with a full thickness cuff tear, which is a normal case scenario? Do you, I mean, what is your protocol for that? Um, okay, so first for nomenclature, I think I think it is very important to simplify things. When a patient has a scapula that does not work well, it is a stam, and this makes it easier for everyone. One. And I don't think it is very relevant to try and find a specific name for each type of uh, abnormal movement. I think it is more important to understand whether it is functional or structural. If it's functional, then you enter in the realm of things that we don't understand very well yet. Uh, and maybe we will never understand, but we don't understand that yet. For a structural, I think it is quite easy. Uh, you need to identify which muscle is going uh, crazy, which muscle does not work. And if the muscle does not work, well, you, you treat that muscle. Uh, and, and I don't think there is a point in trying to distinguish the way the scapula uh, moves uh, if you have a serratus palsy or if you have a trapezius palsy with names. I think you know it's a stam, you examine the patient and you see, okay, this patient has a serratus that is not working. Functional, not, so, sorry, structural stam, paralysis of the uh, long thoracic nerve. He has a trapezius that is not working. It's a structural stam, trapezius palsy, okay? Um, and I think this makes things easier because you're not trying to treat uh, a, a name or you're going to treat a real pathology. Uh, when we examine a hand, uh, we look at, uh, okay, the median nerve is not working and we treat that median nerve. We're not saying it's a, a dyskinesis of the of the fingers, okay? We, we treat the problem. Um, so that's the first question. And then the second question, I don't think it is that frequent to see both um, at the same time. What we see sometimes is is that we see uh, some patients that have some pain on the glenohumeral joint or some uh, uh, stiffness in the glenohumeral joint, and therefore they're going to move up the scapulothoracic joint. But uh, if you test the serratus, if you test the trapezius in these patients, everything works well. So I think the, the, the only focus should be uh, the humeral joint uh, for once, and then uh, to treat the, the cuff problem. And when the cuff and the passive range of motion will be restored, then the patients will most likely have a uh, scapula joint function well properly again after. Okay, sure. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, an excellent talk. Uh, you know, you just, uh, you know, made it simple for us. Uh, you know, my question is, uh, you know, most of the scorings that we actually do, you know, when generally you start off, uh, you know, the, the scorings that we actually use for the shoulder pathologies as such, uh, you know, they've been uh, more or less described keeping the glenohumeral joint uh, in uh, view, you know, the function or, uh, you know, as described because the scapular thoracic pathologies, you know, as we understand more. So do you think there would be a role for uh, a score that would actually incorporate the, because a lot of times, you know, uh, there is scapular pathology that is associated with them. And, you know, you have to see them as a global, uh, you know, pathology. Do you think the scoring systems right now, what we measure, uh, are we measuring differently? Do you think we must take a path to include the scapular pathologies in the scoring? So that would actually create more, uh, you know, kind of like awareness and also the way we actually start treating patients. I agree that it is essential to examine all your patients uh, from the back uh, and without any shirt so you can really see what's going on. Most scores we use are, are functional scores. And so whether the problem comes from the glenohumeral or the scapulothoracic joint, what we want to assess is the function it should work for both. But I think where things will really evolve in our understanding of the scapulothoracic joint and where we do not uh, uh, take it into account enough today is for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, because right now, not the scores that we use, but all the planning systems that we use only focus on the glenohumeral joint. And we're forgetting, 
I would say at least a third of the problem because a third is what it is in a normal shoulder, but in a reverse shoulder arthroplasty is probably more half of the problem and sometimes even more. And uh, we as we talk about lateralization, distalization, but we forget uh, uh, completely something that seems much more essential and, and we're not talking about this at all. If you have huge lateralization, you're going to have a very stiff glenohumeral joint and all the movement is going to come from the scapulothoracic joint. And, and so this is a, a parameter that I think we need to take into account. But for scores, I think right now the scores we use are, are okay to assess what we want. Excellent. So, uh, just on that point, you know, uh, again, it's very difficult as you so showed that uh, the, the the way of simplifying the examination between a functional stamp and also, you know, how do we actually identify a cause? So, a lot of times, um, as you actually mentioned, you know, the, when we don't find a cause for it, uh, obviously the objective way. I mean, when we actually there is a lot of subjectivism to actually determining. Uh, you know, where is the scapular pain and how much is the movement because we are not able to establish the scapular thoracic movement as such, you know, where the pain is emanating from or how much movement. Because I, I know that there's been a lot of studies using like, you know, pins, electromyogram, needle electromyogram to actually character, uh, characterize the movement. So what do you think, you know, in 2024 uh, will be an objective way? What do you, where, where do you think the future lies in kind of measuring them? If we are not able to measure them accurately, is there some way we should be looking at uh, in terms of measuring these scapulothoracic movements uh, more perfectly to kind of treat them? So uh, the, the, the future for sure uh, will be using artificial intelligence algorithms uh, for us to be able to record how our patients move and uh, the, these algorithms will be able to identify the arm and the scapula and to see which moves and, and how much each move. So you have the torso, the scapula and uh, the, the arm. I don't know how soon, but in the next uh, 10 years, it is a, a certainty. So maybe in the next five years at least. Um, and, and this will help us because we will have a direct assessment of the glenohumeral contribution of the movement and the scapulothoracic contribution of the movement. And this will help us and we will have the contralateral side to compare. So I think this will help us a lot. Sure. Thank you. Karthik, you have some questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, JD taught to us very clearly between functional and structural stamp that is nice. I think there are some kind of pathological and some who are functional more of this thing. Yes. But uh, you 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 did lay it to us a nice algorithm of tests and different battery of analysis. If you think there is one or two tests, which is one of the vitals to differentiate between a structural or more of a habitual, there are people who do that. What do you think is that? Just to simplify the algorithm. I think if you want to make it very simple, the so range of motion will not help you too much. I think what is very simple is you ask the patient to raise the shoulders and you, you feel the trapezius. It's contracting or it's not contracting. And you do that one and the other separately because sometimes when they do both at the same time, they do strange things. So you do one, you do both. Then you do retraction and there the trapezius is, is done. Okay. Then you need to look at the serratus. Serratus, it's been described by Bassem very, very well. Elevation. And you do that under 80, 90 degrees and you do that above 90 degrees. If the scapula goes up under and above 90 degrees and at the same time when you do that, you feel the contraction of the serratus. If you do not feel the contraction of the serratus and the scapula goes up under 90 and above 90, the scapula, the serratus anterior does not work. It is structural. If under 90, it does not work. Above 90, it works. It is functional. This patient should not go in the surgical process straight away. I think that's a very valid point. Thanks for enlightening us. The SFRT at 90 and below 90 is one simple trick that uh, may be of uh, the whole algorithm list as well. 
Uh, this is essential. It's, 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 uh, there's a whole paper by Bassem yeah. and Hassan about yeah. this test. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, I think it is important uh, to read it. And, yeah, and, uh, we have been a fan of my that uh, paper. And I think, yes, I think all of our practice as well. Yes. Sure. Uh, Jerry, one another question is uh, obviously, you know, going back to uh, not the neurological causes or identifiable like serratus or trapezius palsy, I'm talking about, you know, the secondary uh, causes of uh, the, 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 the scapula, uh, you know, dyskinesia or now the stamp. So let's, uh, you know, imagine a situation, let's say if we have a clavicular malunion or as you mentioned, you know, briefly in one of your patients where you had an AC joint uh, dislocation and then the patient has secondary developed uh, scapular pathology. So, uh, you know, this if, if the patient has a gross AC joint pathology and secondarily the patient has developed a significant uh, stem, uh, so do you think... Uh, uh, you know, addressing just the STAM would actually be enough or do we have to even go back and address the primary pathology? Because a lot of times what happens is that we find that primarily uh, the patient may have an AC joint pathology or, or, or a disruption and they are okay in the AC joint. But we tend to start see a lot of patients developing scapular pain. You know, they come to us and, uh, you know, we tend to actually assume that, okay, the AC joint is functioning okay. Uh, you are not having any pain in your acromioclavicular joint, but then you know a lot of patients have these scapular problems, and now we are tending to see more of those. So my question is: uh, Do you think just addressing you know them functionally, the scapula would be enough, or do we ever have to actually uh, treat the clavicular malunions or the AC joint, or is it uh, just an overreach? No, I think I think you're raising a, a very good point. And I don't think anyone in the world has the answer right now. So I can tell you the way I do it now, but I don't I don't know if I'm not going to change. What I'm doing is I treat the primary cause and explain to them that this is the reason of why their scapula is is moving abnormally right now. And then I try to rehab them and uh, I rehab them almost after the surgery, not, I mean, not straight away after the surgery, but I rehab them uh, once the surgery is done and the post-op uh, period is, is over. But I rehab them almost exactly like a functional stem. So I really try to focus on the coordinated movement of the scapulothoracic joint with the physiotherapist, but I do not do anything surgically for this. And if this fails, then they might be candidate for surgical treatment of their functional stem. But I think you should try to identify the cause first and treat the cause first. Maybe in, in, in at some point we will see enough patients and see that they do not recover properly. Uh, and maybe there will be an indication to do both at the same time. But I think the logical thing is to treat what has been the cause and then see how they react. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, thank you for the excellent question and the beautiful answer. Uh, uh, Jerry, I have another question again from the audience side and from my side personally. I uh, even the last time when I met uh, Doctor Philip Morado, I uh, he, he I always love his work on the shoulder pacemakers and uh, the way it looked like. And yes, I do understand. But unfortunately, the place where I'm practicing in the Middle East and in the uh, part of the India, I don't think we still have. A lot of access to the shoulder pacemaker stuff. Just for our understanding, what is your clinical indication in your experience to use a shoulder pacemaker? Does it have any role apart from the functional STEM, even in, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in simple words, what do you think is the subset of patients where we should type pacemakers in the future at least? Uh, I I think the the there are plenty of indications probably uh, that we don't know. We've tried that. Sorry. No, no. Can I mean, uh, be, especially yeah, we hear you well. Especially in your experience, yes. we just want. Yes. So we, we've 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 tried it for uh, uh, rehab of uh, after rotator cuff repair for non-operative management of rotator cuff repair. We've tried it in every single indication almost. And 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 it it has a place I think for for all this, but as you've mentioned, it is it is complex to get. 
uh, and even in France, it is not always easy because uh, uh, the patients, they have to come to my hospital and, and they don't really want to do that. And so uh, right now we use it in very specific indications. We use it in everything that is functional. So functional posterior instability, functional STAM, Every, everything where we believe that the problem is a, a lack of coordination of the contraction of the muscles. And we believe that this pacemaker helps the brain to uh, uh, contract more properly the muscles in a, in a more coordinated fashion. And to uh, answer your first comment where you said that it is not available in India or, or in Dubai, I am not sure it is the case. I, I think that you should send an email because honestly, it's very, very easy to 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 use. And so what I do now uh, is I send an email to the people from NCS. My patients, they try to make it work with uh, uh, the physiotherapist and then if they feel comfortable with it, well, they rent it at home. So they are shipped the device because they have a tablet, uh, they, fo they follow what they do, and then they, they ship it back once the treatment is, is, is done. And so it's a rental system. And I am sure, uh, I don't see why it would not be possible in other countries than European countries. Thank you. Okay. I, I take it as valid and offline, I'll get the email ID from you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, regarding the um, uh, scapular pexy um, and also the pec minor release, Jerry. So, you see, usually it is done as a, 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 a you know, procedures that are together. As you said, you know, it is um, where you actually get the brain to reactivate and make sure that you actually get back the muscular control. So, but uh, quite a lot of times you do see that the, some patients, they don't have a lot of uh, STAM lesions, but they have a lot of pec minor tightness um, and they al also have a protracted shoulder. So, do you think there is a role uh, in, in a subset of patients for isolated pectoralis minor release alone? Uh, or do you think that, uh, you know, we should always be combining uh, a scapulopexy with a pec minor, even if they don't have any significant uh, scapular disorders? Is that like, a, uh, you know, a circular, you know, feature that we have to use? Or is it is, is it like an isolated pec minor that still has a role? No, I think there is definitely a role for isolated pec minor uh, tenotomy. I think it is uh, difficult, very difficult to be sure that, the the pain of a patient comes from his pec minor uh, because uh, if someone pushes hard on my pec minor i think it hurts and so if you think this is the only sign it's very difficult to to determine but uh, probably there is also a part of placebo in what we do and so these patients they have pain unexplained pain around this area uh, they see a surgeon that uh, is willing to help them and and probably there is value in that and it is clear that if the patient has no uh, uh, big symptoms of STAM, I would not uh, go in the back, go around the rib uh, and fix the scapula to a rib because this is an invasive procedure and, and you should not do it uh, uh, if it's unnecessary, for sure. Sure. Thank you I very much, uh, Dr. Jerry. I think uh, we are kind of uh, running uh, short of are... time. Yes, one uh, uh, Jerry, just one last time. Sorry, do we have time for just one last question? Is it okay? Or sure. yes, I'm sorry. A quick okay, question. Uh, uh, so, sexy pexy, the name nicely put out by uh, by Sam. So, uh, on the scapula pexy, we know the reason why he used the graft because he wants to elongate. He wants it to be a living tissue there. But especially in where places where a low graft is a toss, and we have to go for an autograft and a lot of things with the patient. Have you tried uh, using only circlage wires for the after the pec minor release and the scapula pexy as well instead of the graft? Uh, does it? Do you think it makes the same role, or always you advise us to go? for an autograft at least? No, I have not. And uh, I think, think uh, I would consider using very, I would not use sutures because you see already the graft has fractured the rib. Uh, and I would not even use some tapes, but I would use very wide uh, tapes. 
So if you look at our paper we published on, on our technique of scapulothoracic fusion, we're using very wide tapes. And I think these are quite protective for the ribs. And so I think there is a, a role and, and, and I had never thought of doing this with this device, but probably the next time I will, I will probably try that because it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay. So any audience questions to Karthik? Anybody? Uh, I think we we still have a lot of things, but I don't want to waste the time. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll catch JD the whole day. He's already after a busy schedule today. So th yeah. uh, if you can uh, if you speak a few words of... Uh, sure. Thank you very much, JD Vertil. I think it's it's been really, you know, uh, yeah, an enlightening talk, really. A lot of questions answered, you know, making it simple, uh, you know, right from physical examination to actually, you know, having a clear-cut indication. So we really love the talk. And thanks for staying back and answering all the questions, you know, patiently. And I'm sure there's a lot more to do in terms of biomechanics, measuring, you know, uh, how we understand scapula. But this um, is uh, was a real eye-opener. Thank you very much, JD. Thank, Thank you. you. Please share uh, my email if you want. Uh, you can hand, hand, so I'll just take a couple of seconds more talking. Of course, the talk was mesmerizing, but I just want to give a small note about JD as well, because it is just three, four weeks back I approached him and uh, he's always a person of his words. You know, he had a busy schedule. Even I think it's now right now, 5.36 there in uh, Paris. And uh, uh, we can look at his eyes from the morning <laughs> OR. And uh, it's, he, he, despite his all things, he takes time and... Uh, a real big thanks to that. Uh, so thank you. We would thank we would you. love to see, especially in a course that uh, Dr. Sendil will and on we soon back in southern part of India very soon and also in Dubai. Will be my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, just a few words. I would like to thank Dr. Sendil Velen for being with us and uh, especially being with me and running this uh, master course successfully. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks and to all one, the TV as well. Yes, yes. The big partners. And again, one last and big thanks to JD. Meet you soon in France and India. Thank you. Thank you.